2 Kings chapter 8. We're, gonna, we're coming to a conclusion here with the Fresh Wind series. Pastor Scott was going to speak uh, this week, but we did a, a swip swap, and so he'll, he'll conclude the series next week. But I want to preach today for a few minutes on fresh restoration. Fresh restoration. This, this message is just going to have just two points. It's going to be simple, um, and, and I hope that it'll speak to you. Restoration. Restoration. Restoration speaks of renewal, speaks of healing, speaks of revival, it speaks of recovery, recovering what was lost. Restoration. I, I don't want to bet, but I feel like there's probably people that are listening, whether in here or whether watching online, that need a restoration of some sort. A restoration, whether it's a, a restoration in relationships, whether it's a restoration in family, whether it's a restoration of hope or joy, maybe you need an emotional restoration. And, and of course, I think we all could use a spiritual restoration. I think we all could use a renewed passion for the Lord, a passion for God. We all could use a renewed passion, burden for the lost. A burden for our community, a burden to reach our community, a renewed calling, a renewed purpose, a fresh restoration. And there's a little story, 2 Kings 8, about a woman who received a restoration. And it says in verse 1, Elisha had told the woman whose son he had brought back to life, take your family, move to some other place, for the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last for seven years. So the woman, so the woman did as the man of God instructed. She took her family and settled in the land of the Philistines for seven years. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines, and she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. So, for seven years, seven years she's been gone. She left everything because of the famine. She left her home. She left her farm. She left her belongings. She left her truck and her tractor and just up and moved to Philistia, the land of the Philistines. Now, Philistia, you've, you've heard of the Philistines. Philistines are bad guys. <laughs> This was the thorn in Israel's side for hundreds of years, frankly, because it, they, they should have been dealt with when they first got into the land. So, they, in essence, they did it to themselves. But Philistia was enemy land. Actually, it was the land of Philistia was, it was actually, uh, would be located around modern-day Tel Aviv, which is right along uh, the Mediterranean coast. Now, when you go to uh, Tel Aviv, it's full of ocean resorts. Tel Aviv is one of the innovation capitals of the world. So it is resorts and innovation, money, parties. It is party central. This would be the equivalent of like leaving Kersey to go to South Beach, Miami. <laughs> party central. Party central. And so a central part of the Philistine life was the worship of Dagon. D-A-G-O-N. He was the god that's half man, half fish. <laughs> Dagon was known as the father of other gods. He's associated with fertility, abundant crops, success, wealth, since they're right along the coast, the, the fishing trade. So they worshiped Dagon. They made sacrifices to him. They even sacrificed their children, believing that Dagon would bless them and make them prosperous and wealthy. It's just sick stuff. But couldn't you also say we're living in the same type of society that in essence are sacrificing our kids, whether it's through indoctrination, uh, through TV, through social media, through progressive godless education. And of course, we actually promote and celebrate late-term abortion, and not just it making it, it, promoting it and celebrating it. And so here's, here's a woman, she's living in that type of culture. She's living in that sick culture for seven years, but amazingly, the culture didn't get into her because it says after the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines. I mean, that, that's, that's a little lesson in itself. How many people would have just stayed in the land of the Philistines? 
How many people would have been lured into to the world and lured into the, the parties and the wealth and, and all of the, the fun in the sun? But, but here's a woman who returned back to where she needed to be. I'm sure there was a temptation. I'm sure she was tempted, but she went back. In regards to restoration, maybe, maybe you're here. Maybe, maybe you're one that's been crying out to God for restoration. Oh, God, restore this. Restore that. God, do this. But yet you're wondering, why isn't God listening? Why isn't God hearing? God, where are you? Well, maybe you've camped out in Philistia. Maybe you've settled down in the land of the Philistines, in the land of sin. Maybe you've settled in the land of disobedience, in the land where you shouldn't be. You're stuck in the world. The point is, how can you expect God's blessings and restoration when you've settled down in a place you shouldn't be? So this woman decides it was time to go back home. It was time to go back to her land. But when she gets back to her land, when she returns, she discovers that strangers have taken over the land. She discovers that they've taken over the farm and they've actually stolen the harvest that was produced from the land. So in verse 4, she goes to the king to try to get it back. It says, and as she came in, the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, Elisha is the man of God. This is Gehazi's Elisha's servant. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. And Gehazi was telling the king about the time Elisha had brought a boy back to life. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. Look, my lord, the king Gehazi excla exclaimed, here is the woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elisha brought back to life. Is this true? The king asked her, and she told him the story. Here's what I want to focus on. I'm not going to focus on all the behind the scenes and all the, the context and, and all of that. I just, want, I just want you to see this little thought. It just, just, this speaks to me. So he directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. Get this. When she was gone, she lost the land. She lost the harvest. But when she came back, when she got before the king, everything she lost was restored. Everything she lost was restored. This was a country song in reverse. She got her house back. She got her farm back. She got her truck back. She got her horse back. She got... Like I said, I'm not focusing on the whole story. I, I just, this one little thought, this, this one little thought that just speaks to me, when she came back and went before the king, she got back what was lost. She got back what was lost. How many of you would like to go away? Oh, actually, she even got more. Think about coming back after seven years. Wouldn't you like to come back after seven years and actually have more <laughs> than when you left? See, that's restoration. That's getting back what was lost. Here's two little, two simple principles that I see about restoration. Num number one, here's the first principle from this passage about restoration. To get back what you lost, you've got to go back to what you left. And you think about that. That's a good principle. To get back what you lost, you've got to go back to what you left. If you want to get something back that was lost, you've got to go back to what or who you left. The land was hers all along, but she had to go back to claim the harvest. You know, this also shows another little principle of you, you leave it, you lose it. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're working at a job, I mean, it, I mean, this can be applied to every area of life. You're, say you're at a job, you leave the job you lose the benefits. You can't expect to get a paycheck if you leave the job. You can't expect to, to keep your health insurance if you leave the job. I mean, that's a principle for every area of life. You leave it, you lose it. If you leave an uh, uh, exercise routine, if you leave sleep and caring for yourself and healthy eating, you leave that, you could lose your health, right? You leave it, 
you lose it. If you leave financial stewardship, you could lose your money. You leave it, you lose it. In society, there's a lot of things we've left. We've left common sense in society, haven't we? We've left morality. We've left biblical values. And what's the result? A lost society. We've lost law and order. We've lost the family function. We've lost leaderships. We've lost our ever-loving minds. That's what we've lost. <laughs> you leave it, you lose it. In the church world, Hebrews 10.25 says, Forsake not assembling together, because if you leave the fellowship, if you leave the body of Christ, you lose the covering. You lose that connection. The Bible says we're two or more agree. The Bible says we're two, we're two are gathered in my name. I'll be in the midst. There is, there is something about fellowshipping and connection with other believers. We're not meant to do life alone. We're not. The devil's goal is to isolate you and, and to have you retreated and have you to, to leave the fellowship. God is always about fellowship, is always about unity. Uh, the church is not a building. The church is not a building. The church is not a program. The church is not a club. The church is not an organization. The church is the people. You are the church. In the kingdom of God, if you leave the things of God, you lose the benefits. You leave the Word of God, you don't read your Bible, well, the, you're forfeiting those promises from being activated in your life. Leave it, lose it. You leave a life of devotion to God in prayer, lose the benefits of closeness to God. Now, I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. We're not saying you lose your salvation like the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit is going to leave you. But I promise you, if you leave the things of God, you leave that closeness with God, you can lose that anointing on your life. You can lose the, the, the feeling and the presence and the power of the Spirit on your life. Leave it, lose it. Leave it, lose it. So as long as the woman stayed in Philistia, she couldn't reap the benefits of the land. Notice thieves. Thieves even came and ravished it. You know, the Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. When we leave it and we abandon it, we're opening the door for the thief to come in. But going back, that's what I love about this. When she went back, that's when she found restoration. There's all kinds of books about revival. There's all kinds of books about restoration. You can type, you can, seven steps to renewal, ten concepts for revival. But you know, you can break all of that. You, all of that can be summed up in this one little principle. If you want to get what was lost, you got to go back to what you left. That's the principle for revival. That's the principle. Our homes need to go back to what we left. Our churches need to go back to what we left because that's where you find restoration and revival. During the American Great Awakening in the 18th century, how many of you have studied history about the first and the second Great Awakening during the 1700s and the 1800s? Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I speak the Great Awakening? Okay, one person. You know, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of history people in here, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or anything. I want you, I'd like to give you a little homework assignment. Google the First and Second Great Awakening. The Methodist Church was started during the Great Awakening, okay? <laughs> the Wesleyan Church was started during the Great Awakening. Uh, the Wesley Brothers. And God moved and it's, it's really around the, the revolutionary time. Study the Great Awakening. We got, we got to learn our history, right? We need to learn our history. But it was during that time that revival swept our nation. 
Revival swept our nation. Even so many of our founding fathers were, were part of, of this revival, this great awakening. And revival swept through the land because of the church altars that were filled with people just, just bowing before God. And, and they're at the altar. It's filled with people of prayer who are going back to what they left. They're going back to repentance. They're going back to the Word of God. They're going back to the, the, to the things of God. They're going back to, to the ways of the first church that was established in Acts chapter 2. That's what They were going back to that early church. What did the early church do? The first church in Acts chapter 2. See, the first church, was, it wasn't like modern-day churches. It wasn't like modern-day self-centered churches that's all about I, 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 what I want, what I want to hear, what message I want, what pastor I want. It was about, God, what do you want? What do you want? It's not about me trying to pacify my emotions. It's here am I, God, use me. I surrender. Like that old hymn we just saw, search me, O oh God. And know my heart. They went back to what was left. They went back to what they left. Charles Finney, one of the revivalists, he, quote, he said this, Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. It is giving up one's will to God in deep humility. You know what? I'm just here to declare churches of America need to go back to this. We need to go back to this. Do you agree? We need to go back to what we left. You know, I, I love our purpose statement right here at the church. It's, in your, it's on your bylaws, and it's one of the things when I, I was searching things that I love this purpose statement here. By the way, this purpose statement that was put that was established here for Kersey Community Church, this was way before me. I asked the elders, when was this put into place? They said, man, this thing's been in place for decades. But, but why do I love it? Because what's it say? It's all about reaching people for Jesus. It's about teaching people the gospel, teaching people about Jesus. It's about worshiping Jesus. I heard Jerry say, all glory goes to God. All glory goes to God in a prayer. You know, that's what worship is all about, where all the glory goes to God. All the singing goes to God. All the worship is for the glory. That's in your purpose statement, worshiping. And then it speaks of fellowshipping. That's connecting with one another. And then if you read, if you read at the end, it says to mature the believers. And I love that. I actually preached on that a few weeks ago. I broke it down. I'm a simple-minded guy. I, can, I forget these long things, but I just broke it down into four parts. Reach, teach, worship, connect. I can remember that. That's your purpose statement. Reach, teach, worship, connect. Notice that your, your purpose statement, it's not a self-serving purpose, is it? Reach others for Jesus. Teach others about Jesus. Worship Jesus. Connect with others. Connect with others. Because God's purpose is always an others-focused purpose and a Jesus-focused purpose. And I don't know, I, I, just, I just sense that we just need to go back to the purpose. I just sense that the Spirit is, is trying to, to take us back to our purpose, to unite around His purpose for the church. Let me, let, me, let me tell you, I'm not trying to push a new purpose on you from me. I'm not bringing my own agenda. So, Ray, where are you, where, where are you taking us? Where, where are we going? I'll tell you where we're going. We're going back to the purpose. Back back. The Bible says, remove not the ancient landmarks. Those old, those, old, uh, th th those old landmarks that are established in the preaching of the Word. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm just an old-fashioned preacher. I come from an old-fashioned preaching family. I I, I, I'm, I'm sick, and, and, and it, it, just, it, it, it just nauseates me 
on some of the things and, and some of the churches that are out there. They're trying to be so innovative and trying to go this, that, that they're getting away from what God's called them. They're so focused on doing this, and you got to please this, and you got to please that. And, and it's almost like church has become a show, hasn't it? And we got lights, and we got smoke, and we got all of this, and it's a, it, it, is a, it is a show from heart. Don't you think God is calling us back to the basics of the Word of God? That's what the Great Commission is all about. So what's my focus? It's going back to reaching people for Jesus, teaching people about Jesus, worshiping Jesus fellowshipping and connecting. You know, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of when the Ark of the Covenant, when it was, it was stolen from the Israelites, it was lost. In 2 Samuel 6, it was placed in the house of Obed-Edom. David had just become king, and he had heard how Obed-Edom was being blessed and, and prospered. I mean, man, his house, it was, it was just a prosperous house. Why? Because the ark was in his house. The ark of the covenant in the Old Testament represents the presence and the power of the Lord. And so the problem is the ark was supposed to be in the tabernacle in Jerusalem. The ark was supposed to be in the house of God. So David's like, we got to get the ark We've got to get the presence of God back in its rightful place. And so, one of the first initiatives from King David was to get the ark back. Because without God's presence in the tabernacle, David acknowledged there's no power. There's no power. There's no life. It's just dead, self-centered rituals. David, he said, I got 2 Samuel 6, verse 12. He says, I got to get the presence. I've got to get the ark back to the house of God. And that's a challenge for the church today. That without the presence of God, without the ark of God's presence in the church, there's no life. There's no power. Without the Holy Spirit, the power of the Lord in the church, it's just rituals. It's just traditions. And just like David had to go and bring the presence of God back to the house of God, don't you think that God is calling us to bring His presence back to His house? Because that's where life is. That's where the power is. Think about it. This is God's house. Shouldn't the presence of God be welcomed in his house? It's his house. How narcissistic are we as Christians? We think this is our house. This isn't our house. This is God's house. I can't pastor without the presence of God. I can't pre. I'm not smart enough to lead without the presence of God. We, we, we can't even sing songs without the presence of God. We can't do anything without the presence of God. Oh, how churches need to go back, get God's presence back in the house of God. In closing, just go back to 2 Kings 8, back to the woman. Back to the woman. I love it says that she came back. She went to see the king. She went to see the king. She went to see the king. The king. You know who the king is, don't you? Well, here, it was the king of Israel. But for us, spiritually, our king is the Lord. My second point, and I'm closing. To get back what you lost, you got to return to the king. We got to return to the king. It was when she returned to the king that she received restoration for all that was lost. That's the key to our restoration for whatever you need, for, what, for, for your recovery. <laughs> the key is to return to the king. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 says, Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts, not your garments. In other words, the, the, I, don't, I don't need the show. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, rend your heart. Search, search your heart. That's what I'm after. 
He says, return to the Lord your God, and, and I love this, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. I love that because it doesn't matter how far away we've gotten from him. <laughs> it doesn't matter if we've been in the land of the Philistines. It doesn't matter if we've even camped out and stayed in the land of the Philistines a little too long. The good news is the king is waiting for us to return. He's full of grace. He's full of love. He's slow to anger. He's waiting to welcome us back so he can restore his presence so he can restore what was lost. In Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, the lost son, who he, he wasted his inheritance, but he returned home. He returned home after living in sin and debauchery. And it says, and I love this, it says, the father saw him coming a long way off. That means the father saw the son before the son saw the father. Why? Because every day the father came out. And he was looking for his son to return. And it said that the, the father, he ran to his son. He fell on his neck, put a ring on him, put a robe on him. And that's our heavenly father. He's there. Wait, he sees us before we see him. And he's waiting to, to run to us, to, to cover us in his grace and put a ring on, his, on, on our finger and to restore all that was lost. Don't. Don't you want a fresh restoration today? I want to ask you to bow your heads. That's our Father. That's our King. That's our Savior. When we humbly return to Him, He comes to us. He welcomes us. He restores what was lost. You know, what a picture of the gospel, because that's the gospel. While your heads are bowed, that's the gospel. The gospel isn't about what we can do for God and through our works, he saves us. No, the gospel is receiving what God has done through Christ for us. It's what he has done for us. Jesus shed his blood on the cross to save us. He was resurrected to give us life. We receive it. We receive what he has done. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, today's the day to receive him. You're not promised another second if you're watching online, why don't you pray with me? The Bible says, believe in your heart. God has raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth. You shall be saved. You shall be welcomed into the family of God. I want to lead you in a prayer right now for salvation. If you don't know that you know that, that heaven is your home, if you don't know that you know that Jesus is your Savior, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Just pray with me. Say, Father, I know you sent Jesus to the cross. Right where we're at, you can pray that. I know you sent Jesus to the cross. I know you sent him to die for my sin. And I ask you to save me. I put my trust in Jesus. I put my trust in Jesus. Save me, Lord, from my sins. Just a simple prayer of faith, and the Lord will save you. If you prayed that prayer before you leave, why don't you come up and see me, Pastor Scott, one of the elders. We want to pray with you. We want to welcome you into the family of God. And now, church, as we prepare for communion, and you, just keep your heads bowed. Would you mind playing Search Me, O God, the song that we played, the hymn? Search me, O God, know my heart, know my thoughts. Before we partake of communion, do you need to return to the Lord? Do you need to return to the Lord? Are there any areas of your life that you need to lay down before the Lord? Just take 30 seconds to a minute. Just pray before the Lord. Search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. What do you need to return to? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you.